Hello, everyone. Okay, so uh, yes, you, you heard who I am. I'm Jamie. So today I want to basically um, go through a few things. I want to demystify how Scala builds uh, work. So, you know, when you uh, tell your Scala command or the SPT or whatever to compile, what is actually going on underneath. And then I want to also explore how do we actually optimize these um, builds to make them faster than just running the plain compiler on its own. And there are also some ways that you can optimize your build so that it um, benefits from the speed uh, performance increases that uh, the build tools can optimize. And also I want to explore kind of the solution space for how we can make it even faster in the future. So uh, I'm uh, basically, I work at the Scala Center. I've been there for about four years. Um, Scala Center is a foundation for open source uh, Scala. We produce uh, educational material. We work to um, facilitate community processes like the Scala um, improvement process. And as part of the Scala uh, 3 compiler team, I've, um, there's a photo of me in both of those things. But yeah, I've, uh, I've done several things such as adding the Tasty support to Scala 2. Uh, I've done some work to uh, improve uh, type class derivation. I uh, add, implemented enums and several improvements to the incremental compilation in Scala 3. And uh, if you care to look at what else we do in the Scala Center for the, for the past five years, then there's a QR code, uh, but yeah. So let's have a look at what actually happens when you try and build your Scala projects. And I was gonna say this, I'm gonna take like the 9,144 meter uh, view, which to American people is 30,000 foot, but, uh, my, I want to say that by, if you understand the Scala build, then you can make it better for you and work faster. And uh, I included this quote here from Donald Nuth, uh, which is the, that premature optimization is the root of all evil. And really by this, I just want to say that uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about performance and optimization and things, but don't obsess over this because there's probably some hidden overheads that you might be introducing by obsessing with this. Um, so yeah, let's take an example of a single um, project, just a, a basic web service that you might put like a, in a Lambda online. So it's just this one directory web service and it has about 50 source files, 10 library dependencies, um, and we're compiling it with the, the Scala CLI, which is gonna be the new Scala command. So when you hit Scala run, and then say the current directory, it's just telling you that it's compiled and then, wow, it's, it's running, but really is what is going on there. Uh, so really it's more like four core steps. First, you have to fetch all the dependencies such as uh, libraries and then maybe you want to generate some source files, for example, uh, protobuf um, schemas. You might want to generate some data structures from that. Um, these typically happen only once every time that you uh, change the setting in your build. Uh, so those can be sort of cached quite easily just because you only need to download once. And because the version doesn't change, then you don't need to re-download it. Um, then the next thing we're gonna do is actually compile those 50 source files to uh, Java class files. And this is one of the slowest parts of the build. So really uh, we want to uh, optimize that so you, it happens as few times as possible. And then the next step is to create a launcher and then execute the code. And then that hap also happens once every time you build the code, but it's usually uh, a lot quicker. Uh, so if you want to imagine the compilation uh, process, you can sort of imagine that the Scala compiler is this big red pipeline that just uh, takes in source files and library dependencies and produces some class files and tasty files um, and semantic DB. So what are these? Basically, if you put the 50 source files in, then uh, the Scala compiler is going to use a single thread to process every uh, source file and produce these outputs. So we have class, fi class files, which is the actual code that runs on the Java virtual machine. 
Then we have these tasty files, which are basically the, um, they store the signatures of all the definitions. And this is what helps you to use library dependencies. Um, and then we produce semantic DB if you're using the metals uh, IDE. So this process is quite long, about 15 seconds. And you can imagine that uh, if you only edit one line, then uh, and then edit another line and then compile, it's going to be a lot of time wasted if you keep doing that 15 second compilation. And especially for a, a huge project, not just 50 files, but maybe thousands and thousands, then that's going to be super long. So in reality, it's only about one second or so, and that's thanks to incremental compilation. And uh, I'm going to explain incremental compilation, but first we'll take a look at this uh, other process which builds onto that, uh, which incremental compilation builds on called separate compilation. So separate compilation is basically what allows the compiler to uh, know about definitions that were compiled previously. And that is the fundamental building block of the Scala library ecosystem. Um, because for example, say you have a source file a.scala and it's just the hello world program. Um, in this, in this one file, you are already referencing two things that don't exist in a source file, the main annotation and the print line definition. And these come from the class path. So that just means that once upon a time in the past, these were compiled and now we can reuse the signatures that were stored in these libraries to resolve things. So incremental compilation builds upon separate compilations to take those class files and tasty files that have already been compiled um, in one compilation, like the previous compilation. And then the next compilation, we say, uh, only the source files that changed, we're going to combine that with the class files from the previous compilation and try and hopefully have a faster build than before. So visually, what this looks like is saying, instead of compiling every single one of these source files, you're going to only compile A because you edited A. And then perhaps uh, the changes that were made in A affect the D file and the F file. So we need to track those changes and recompile those. And then hopefully uh, after we've compiled that, we've only compiled three out of all those files. So hopefully that should be faster. But really to um, evaluate if it's worth having incremental compilation over the just cleaning and compiling everything from scratch is to say that we have two rules that really must be followed all times or as close as possible as we can. And that is that the incremental compilation should be correct, meaning that everything that should have been compiled must be compiled and that it should be performant. So uh, the calculation of what things should be compiled should be very fast. And we shouldn't do over compilation, which means uh, compile too many things that weren't actually necessary to compile to have the same uh, artifact produced at the end. So uh, in the current build tools, such as SBT, um, mill, Scala command, um, we use something called Zinc, which is the name of the incremental compiler. And it basically maximizes those two points, correctness and performance with something called the name hashing algorithm, um, which was developed by uh, that, that, that person, I'm not going to pronounce it, uh, and other people. Um, so yeah, we'll take a look at how Zinc works. So imagine you have your 50 source files and a library dependency, and then uh, the Scala command or SPT is going to tell Zinc, oh, we need to compile all these source files. And then um, let's say you've never compiled it before, so you just checked out the project. And then uh, basically Zinc says, oh, well, I haven't seen these before, so let's compile everything. And then it's going to produce um, class files at the end in this sort of cloud in the, in the bottom here. And also something called an analysis uh, file. And that contains several things. Um, but basically, once we've done that, then we can say that the compilation succeeded and we are left with those analysis and class files. Then let's say you edit the A file and then you try and recompile again. So then it will say compile all those files. But actually, because we have this analysis, which is a cache of all the changes and the APIs and stuff, we can say, oh, only A changed. So let's compile just that. 
and uh, we've basically feed in the class path from before uh, of the classes that were previously compiled and reproduce the same thing. Then now we have a new analysis, and then we say, oh, actually, the changes in A affect D and F. So those are the things that should be recompiled. And then we produce more analysis, more class files, and now nothing else needs to be invalidated. So we say the completion succeeded. But um, how do yeah, how do we actually produce this analysis? Um, basically, again, we'll say here's Zinc. It wraps the Scala compiler, um, and it's sort of a pipeline. And we zoom into that X-ray and say, uh, okay, so we have the red bar, which is the Scala compiler, and it's basically split into uh, many different modules that process the code through a pipeline, and those are called phases, and uh, each phase has a separate responsibility. So we have first the parser, which takes the text file, analyzes it, and produces something called the abstract syntax tree, which is basically the representation of the code that the compiler understands. Then you have the typer phase, which checks that the abstract syntax tree is actually a proper Scala program. Um, and then it basically attaches uh, types and information to that tree to say this is valid. Then a bit further on, we can reach the pickler phase, and that uh, takes the abstract syntax tree with all the correct signatures, and then it serializes it into a form called Tasty, which is a file that will eventually get shipped with your library. And then there's several other phases that we go through, which gradually um, modify that abstract syntax tree to make it closer and closer to what the Java virtual machine expects. And then we reach Gen B code, which produces the class files. And at this point, we also uh, uh, write the tasty files to the file system. Um, what Zinc does is we modify this pipeline by sh putting before uh, the pickler phase, we put two extra phases. So we have this uh, so-called dependencies phase, which goes through the abstract syntax tree and detects um, like method bodies and s looks inside them and says, oh yeah, you've used this definition from this file, so we'll track that as a dependency. And then we also have the API phase, which uh, records the signatures a bit like the pickler. And both of these phases, they then uh, call this callback that's provided by Zinc to say, uh, yeah, here are the dependencies, et cetera. And then that gets written into this analysis. And uh, so the analysis contains several things. We have uh, stamps which are basically the timestamps of every time the file was written, when was it written, and also a hash of the contents, which basically just is an efficient way to track whether a file has changed. Uh, then we have the APIs, which is a tree data structure, again, representing the signatures of your code, which means basically the, the shape of definitions, the return types of methods, the argument body, arguments, et cetera, and the dependencies. Um, what do they allow you to do? When you see a stamp, then that basically says, yep, yeah, this file has been modified on a file system, so we're going to pick it up and recompile that. And then this is what the APIs look like. Basically, um, we can say that oh, z.scala has this class z, and it has these definitions that look like this. But we don't record the right-hand side, uh, the method bodies, etc. And then we come to this thing called name hashing which is where we basically um, combine all the uh, definitions with a similar name. So you see in here, we have three foo definitions and one bar definition. And then, uh, and then Zinc basically internally takes those APIs and computes a hash of them to, uh, so that it can detect any changes that occur. And so uh, you combine all the overloads of foo into one single hash. And the same with bar. And the, the reason you have this is that basically um, if you have one file that depends on uh, some foo method from Z and then you add a new overload, then uh, we need a way to say that, oh, actually, uh, maybe the overload that you call needs to be re-resolved to a different one and maybe you'll have a compile error the next time. So uh, this is just, again, a, an efficient way to track that you have several different overloads. Um, more concretely, what it allows you to do is say, 
uh, once upon a time, A used to have this. So um, you had a, a value bar and a method foo, returning string. And then when you change the file, now you renamed uh, bar to kooks and uh, you change the result type of foo to int from string. And now because we know these changes have occurred, then they'll have a different hash in the name hashing, and that means that any de file that depended on those definitions should be recompiled as well. And what do dependencies look like? It's basically a very simplified version of how we reference different names that come from source files. So, um, for example, let's say you have um, file d.scala and it defines the class d. And we say, oh, well, this file contains a class that inherited from class A, for example. And then also we could say that the, um, like, a method in class F used some sort of thing called foo. And then we can also um, say that that foo or any sort of those definitions came from class A. And so what this basically means in principle is there's a very simple way to say that when you edited A, um, those changes that you saw before are going to affect the dependencies because they'll flag up as, oh, you used foo and that changed. And also uh, you inherited from A and that changed, so you should re be recompiled. Um, but now you see this, you might ask a question like, uh, okay, so there is potential to get a speed up from how you can um, arrange your build. And I would say basically, don't obsess over making it as fast as possible, but there's still a way to speed up your build, which is to use smaller files. If you use, basically, if you use smaller files, then um, you're going to have a more fine-grained uh, graph of dependencies. So let's say if you make an edit in one file and it only affects one line in a, di in a different file, then it'd be quite a waste to have that dependent file be really huge because you only need to, you're only really affecting a one line change. So if you make a file smaller, then you're going to have a uh, faster compilation because uh, less changes will be spreading around the code base. Um, yeah, so we had to bring uh, incremental compilation to Scala 3 for its uh, release of 3.0. And there were a few challenges, which is basically how do we maintain compatibility with Zinc? Because the Zinc compiler was originally developed for Scala 2 as a compiler plugin of Scala 2. And all of its sort of callbacks and APIs were designed around Scala 2. So we have to question how do we adapt for that? And also, how do we remain stable under Scala 3? Because we want to continue adding new features eventually to Scala 3. And the Zinc compiler is not part of the Scala 3 code base. So we want to make sure that we're stable. How do we do that? Well, the Scala 3 compiler ships with its own API phase and the dependency phase, and also ships with its comp a compiler bridge, which is what allows Zinc to talk to the Scala compiler. We can also, because we ship it in the Scala 3 uh, repository, uh, we can test compatibility with any new features that we might add before we even release it. So we can make sure that we're not going to break someone's code or whatever. Uh, one of the example uh, changes that we had to make was how do we support inline methods? Um, if you haven't seen inline method, then imagine you see uh, an inline def foo. It has two parameters. One of them is an inline parameter. And it calls this macro method, which is uh, basically to find the power of x to n, x to the power of n. And uh, we had to make a specific adaption to the API phase to support uh, inline methods, because basically, uh, because um, inline methods are inlined, that means that anytime you change an inline method's uh, body, then that actually might fail uh, uh, to uh, type check when you inline it. So we need to make sure that any change at all to an inline method gets tracked. Um, and also, because you call this other macro within that one, which is the power method, then if the power method changes, changes, then also when you call foo, that will change as well. So how do we track that? And basically, we 
uh, traverse the body of the any inline method to say, well, uh, how is it defined? So we will actually record that you called this method with these arguments, and we're going to uh, also go transitively into the power method as well. And that basically says, uh, is a way more fine-grained way of tracking that. Um, yeah, so what we do is we, we convert that tree into a uh, basically an integer or hash code. Um, and then we append that to the signature. So now I've covered um, how incremental compilation works. I want to broaden the scope um, to say that we actually, uh, obviously we have multi-project builds in Scala as well, not just single project builds. And uh, what it, if you don't know what, what is a multi-project build, it's basically we reuse the idea of separate compilation um, to imagine that your application, instead of being one big blob of files, is actually, you could say, why not uh, treat it as a collection of libraries that depend on each other? So you have A, B, C, and you, you, you use the class files from A to compile B, and then the class files from B to compile C, et cetera. Uh, I give you, I would advise that you should split your application to smaller projects, not only because it helps you reason about the structure of the code, um, for like onboarding new developers, it's easier to understand uh, how the project works. Um, but also it can actually increase the speed of compilation in certain ways. So, and I leave this quote here, uh, which is a hint. So we say like, well, are two threads better than one? Which is a pun, I guess. But uh, take these Scala files and basically the way you split it up is you say that, oh yeah, you know, the, the ones on the left and in pink are in one compilation group, and then the red are in another, and the blue in another. So, if, for example, if I bring back the web service um, project from the beginning of the talk, then let's split it up into several modules. So we have common at the top, and then we have database uh, and authorization and the model, which it, I guess is part of your web service, and they depend on common, and then server. Uh, actually is the application at the end that brings together all these libraries. So how does this uh, split up make your code faster? Uh, the, the clue here is that I have colored um, each level differently, and basically anything with the same color can be compiled in parallel with each other. Um, so if you imagine you have a single, a single core CPU and you're trying to build your project, uh, even if you split it into multi-projects, then if you only have one thread, then it's not really going to give you any benefit. But then if you turn on the multi-threading, then now we can compile the database authorization and model in parallel, and we save some time at the end. Um, but then, well, now you see that this you save some time, and really um, you might ask, should I optimize my build by splitting up into so many modules that everything is going to be super parallelized. And uh, I would say you shouldn't really do that because, um, you know, there's some sort of overhead when you split things into uh, smaller and smaller modules, but also uh, you will be limited by the, uh, the number of cores in your CPU, so don't go too crazy with that. But still, I would say as a sort of second tip, you can definitely split your apps into smaller projects just because it makes it easier to understand the code. And you might benefit from some parallelism. Um, but can we actually do better than just parallelizing some modules? And I say, yes, you can. And this is something um, called build pipelining, which we'll have a look at right now. Uh, so pipeline builds, basically the idea with that is that you say that um, given a graph of different projects that depend on each other, you should be able to start the downstream projects before the upstream projects have finished compilation. So we have some prior work on that, which is, uh, well, Morgan Stanley, they gave a talk this morning about the Optimus platform. And uh, there's also the tool Bloop, which was developed at the Scala Center. And that had a sort of uh, fork of Zinc, which supported pipelining. 
And today in SBT, you can turn on pipelining. Um, so we'll see how this works. So as a reminder, um, let's say you have three projects that depend on each other. And even though I've got multi-threading turned on, there's zero parallel compilation going on because they depend on each other. So you have to wait for project A to be finished before project B starts, et cetera. But the, the theory is, is that in the perfect circumstances, when you turn on the pipelining, then you can basically start project B before project A finishes and project C before project B finishes. And you should end up with some save time theoretically. Uh, why do I say theoretically? I mean, the, uh, the problem is that, you know, not always are projects exactly the same size. And um, yeah. How does this actually work? Basically, uh, we can start the, the downstream project as soon as we've produced signatures, which um, if you recall from before was when we were in the pickling phase, we produced Tasty, which has signatures. And that's um, only in the sort of first top third of the compiler. So really after that point, anything after that can be done in the background while we start the downstream compilations. And this is in active development for Scala 3.3. And uh, I have some experimental results I will reveal later. Um, and possibly we could uh, port this to LTS. Um, it depends on if we can maintain compatibility with uh, the SBT 1.3 series. Um, so how does this work? This is the same pipeline I showed earlier. And um, to remind you, um, at the Gen B code phase, which is the very end of the compiler, that's where we write these tasty files to the file system, which is what the downstream compilation it requires in order to begin. And yeah, after we run the pickler phase, then actually we are writing the tasty files in a separate thread. Um, so that can save a bit of time if we reorder the phases to say, while we're tracking the API and the dependencies, that's when we can do the writing of tasty. And then uh, when the dependency phase finishes, then we can output this uh, so-called early output jar, which just contains tasty. And we can even produce tasty files for Java files. Um, so that means that we can have projects that have both Java sources and Scala sources, and they can support pipelining as well. And basically, once you've produced that early output, then all the previous uh, upstream phases from, from Pickler onwards are now just done as a background task by the build tool. And uh, yeah, so inside the early output jar, we have just tasty files, even for the Java file. Uh, so sorry, yeah, now I'm going to sort of show you some results because I have um, been working on the pipelining for Scala 3 and on this computer, which is like an eight core CPU with 16 gigabytes of RAM. What I did was essentially take some popular SBT projects and then I ran clean followed by compile uh, several times over and over again so that I make sure that the JIT compilation uh, improves the performance of the compiler. And uh, let's have a look. So if you don't know, there's a project called uh, Lee Chess, which is um, like a chess website, but it's built with Scala. It has about 308,000 lines of code. And basically what happens is on the standard 3.3 um, LTS version, it takes 72 seconds to build all the projects in, in LeechS. And it takes about six gigabytes of RAM to, uh, to do that. Um, and then with my changes, with the pipelining, it only took 55 seconds, which is 5,600 lines per second. However, uh, it did use a lot more memory to do that. And you, intuitively, you could say that this is because um, when you have one project and two projects compiling at the same time, then they, you have to keep both of the ASTs in memory at the same time rather than uh, garbage collecting one before the other finishes. Um, so really, it's about 33% memory overhead for this specific project. 
but the the performance increase is about uh, 20 23 percent so if you care about that that's quite a good result and i also tried this on some other projects such as uh, scala dex um, aka aka http um, cats and this project riddle which I, I don't know i just saw it in the notifications one day so i modeled that and also the dotty compiler which is the scala 3 compiler um, so you see not all projects benefit. I mean, every single one did benefit at least 1%, such as Peko, where that's not really uh, super good. But why did Scala Dex do so well? Let's have a look. Um, so 31% improvement. And if we take a look at the project layout of Scala Dex, um, you, you see it basically has the best of both worlds. It maximizes parallelism, but it also has uh, several layers of dependencies. Um, so then basically the, the, well, I'll show you in this diagram. So imagine in a perfect scenario, uh, every single one of those projects took the exact same time to build. Theoretically, this is what it looks like. And then theoretically, when you turn on the pipelining, then you're gonna get this much speed up. And every single layer level of dependency is gonna increase that save time. Um, but it's not perfect, and the reason is, is that um, basically it's limited by however much uh, memory you have, how much cores on your CPU. So uh, if you ever thought, okay, let's super duper optimize the build to put 100 levels of dependencies and hundreds of levels of uh, parallelism, you shouldn't do this just because unless you have a supercomputer. And so my advice is don't make your projects too small. And this is the reason why. Uh, I also tried the Guardian front end. This was built with Scala 2.13, um, but it does use the power, it does have pipelining enabled. Um, so really it has one big core module and then many, 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 many uh, short, small modules that depend on that. And on my machine, at least, um, when I turned the pipelining on, it had sort of no benefit. And really, uh, the reason is, is that, okay, you do start the downstream compilation when common sort of reaches the signatures, but then uh, there's too many separate projects taking up all the threads. So basically, once you finish those, then uh, the, the, the back end of common and happens at the end, so it really doesn't save any time. So uh, yeah, to summarize, uh, your mileage may vary based on how many cores you have and how much RAM you have. And what, what are some possible ways that we could improve in the future? Um, there's been uh, the talk of having a two-phase uh, compilation, which is what Morgan Stanley is doing. And we also have uh, so-called pipelining incremental invalidations. And what is that? The idea of the two-pass compilation is that basically, uh, at least with the Scala 3 um, implementation that I'm trying, which was developed by uh, Guillaume at the Scala Center, you do the first pass and you only go up to uh, the, the pickler phase, but you basically skip the right-hand sides of uh, definitions because if you have an explicit result type, then all you need is the signature and you can skip the method body. So that should save some time getting to the pickler phase there. And then you do in the second pass, you run the full compilation with all phases and all method bodies. Um, and you can parallelize that because at this point you've already recorded the signatures. So there's, the second passes can uh, basically split up the source files appropriately and then use the separate compilation to read the signatures of uh, things in other, other parallel branches. And that should lead to the same save time. And today I did a, a small benchmark with the Dotty compiler code base and just the uh, compiler module itself, which has 142,000 lines of code. And with the Scala 3.3, um, basically without any pipelining, without any two-pass compilation, it took 29 seconds. Uh, but then when I turned on the two-pass compilation, it took 19 seconds, which is a 34% improvement. 
And theoretically, we could improve that even further. Um, but uh, it's, it's sort of a solution space that is quite complex. Um, so that's really all I have for today. So does anyone have any questions?